November 1st, 1700. The inbred and sickly king of Spain, Carlos II, dies at the age of 38, with no heir to replace him, leaving the vast, rich Spanish empire without ruler. The two great dynasties of Europe, the Bourbons and the Habsburgs, race for the throne, only for the crisis to spark into all-out war. Forgotten in history, the war would last around 13 years, with war waged on such a scale and devastation not seen since the Thirty Years' War, on several fronts, on multiple continents. This is the War of the Spanish Succession. After the immensely bloody Battle of Malplaquet in 1709, the campaign in northern France grounded to siege operations and smaller engagements. While both sides did what they could to plan and take action on their next move, the alliances in Spain were finally able to launch the campaign of 1710. After the decisive Franco-Spanish victory at the Battle of Almanza in 1707, the Bourbons captured many Allied strongholds like Hativa, Alicante, and Tortosa in Catalonia. The Portuguese front came to a close after the Battle of La Godinha in the summer of 1709. The Allies possessed only a portion of Arahan and Catalonia. Luckily for them, the Spaniards could not launch a serious offensive during the last few years as troops were required elsewhere on other fronts. This gave invaluable time for the army of Archduke Charles and his allies to reinforce and regroup. They even managed to seize the island of Menorca in 1708. Emperor Joseph I of Austria transferred 5,000 fresh Austrian and Palatine troops from Italy. The Dutch also hesitantly sent 1,000 recruits to Spain as well. Archduke Charles Habsburg Spanish and Catalonian armies were also finally ready to take the field. The British contingent numbered around 4,000 to 5,000 men strong led by the aggressive-minded James Stanhope. In contrast, the Field Marshal Guido von Stachenberg, the cousin of the Stachenberg who led the defense of Vienna in 1683, took a more cautious approach to leading. For compromise, Stanhope would be leading the vanguard of the Allied army, the army which in total numbered over 30,000 men. For the Alliance, the situation was dangerous and desperate. A sudden offensive against the Spanish army would need to result in complete success. The overall strategy was to break out of Catalonia, force the Bourbons out of the region, and swiftly capture Madrid. With Madrid in solid allied hands, Philip V would have to be forced to capitulate and give up control of the Spanish Empire. With established allied control and closer supply lines, occupying Madrid was expected to be much easier than the capture of 1706. The commander of the Spanish army in the east, the Marquis de Radariaz, was made captain general of the army that year, leading 22,000 men. In stark contrast to his adversaries, his previous record remained unimpressive. Nevertheless, King Philip V gave him the command, believing Villadariath never had an opportunity to really be tested. Once the campaigning season began, the army took on an endemic plague, which rapidly spread throughout the Spanish camp. This was further increased with the exhausting march towards Balaguer, which the Spanish wished to occupy. Stauhenberg and Stanhope left enough men behind to garrison the northern region of Catalonia to discourage a French advance, bringing with them more or less 24,000 men to Balaguer and Saragossa. Villardarius' cavalry found themselves on the heights above the small town of Almenar in the sweltering Spanish heat. To their opposite would be the cavalry of the Allied advance guard led by none other than James Stanhope. On the morning of the 27th of July, 1710, the Spanish army crossed the river Noguera from the south. They heard from local sources that the Allies had rapidly began crossing the Noguera from the north to meet them. Surprised by the rapid advance, Villadariath, accompanied by King Philip V himself, immediately began turning his men toward the north, intending to meet the Allies upon receiving those reports. 
Meanwhile, General Stanhope led his advance guard to their positions above the Spanish. This included the Dutch Schlippenbach, Matha, and the British Queen Anne and Pepper's Dragoon regiments. The Spanish advance guard also waited for the rest of their army to cross the river. The Spanish, however, arrived much slower than the Allied columns, not anticipating a fast march by their enemy. Stanhope wanted to attack and drive back the Spaniards while they were barely across the Noguera, but Stachenberg halted any such attack, worrying that defeat of his numerically inferior cavalry would spell disaster for the Allied army. Both armies marched in broad daylight amidst the Spanish heat at its full force. The Allies had planned for this move and rushed their leading columns forward to meet the Spaniards still strung out on the march. By 6 p.m., all the Allied army except for 12 cannon were deployed for battle. The Spanish only had 9 battalions of infantry and no cannon, but most of their cavalry had crossed in Noguera. Philip V and Villadardith remained ignorant of the army forming on the heights above them, only citing the advanced cavalry under Stanhope. The Allies would soon decide it was finally time to strike and defeat the Spanish in detail. At 6.30 p.m., a battery established on the heights finally opened fire on the still-forming Spaniards. Stano, now leading the left-wing cavalry, began a slow trot to maintain order in the Allied ranks. Before 7 p.m., he brought the cavalry 200 meters before the enemy, an enemy which was unprepared, thinking that Stanhope wouldn't dare attack a numerically superior force. They believed it to be a feint. Allied horsemen then crashed into the first line of Spanish cavalry under General Amezaga. The Spanish did not expect the Allies to attack that night, and the first line quickly fell back, some men not even mounted on their horse. Stanhope described the charge as, The sun, then, was not above a quarter of an hour high when the left began to engage, and the right was soon, and behold, how like lions our men fell upon them with sword in hand. General Amazaga hastily deployed his second line of cavalry against Stanhope, who was also barely in formation by the time the first line had broken. They were hurriedly rushed forward by Amazaga as he escaped the disaster on the first line, and met Stanhope's cavalry. Fortunately for the Allies, their momentum never slowed. Amazaga's last line of defense on the Spanish right already began to waver. In response to the charge on the right flank, the Spanish left, which hurried to prepare themselves, charged into the Allied cavalry from their right. Here the Spaniards initially start strong, and slowly gain ground against their enemies. Casualties on the Spanish side were heavier, but the Allies lost the Earl of Roxford and Colonel of the Cavalry Regiment of the same name, and the Count of Nassau who was also leading his own regiment in the charge. Still, the Spanish cavalry as a whole slowly began to waver. At the same time, the largely imperial infantry began their attack on the Spanish infantry on their right wing. Philip V, mounted and with his cavalry, risked his life in the fighting. His infantry were also ill-prepared for an allied assault, and the Spanish guards suffered disproportionately high casualties compared to other regiments. Two of their colonels, de Gironella and Don Juan de Fuegora, were killed along with many rankers and lower NCOs and officers. The Spanish guard did not falter, however, and held their ground. Philip V was nearly captured or even killed until the Spanish guard cavalry broke through to rescue him. He was also, ironically, escorted out by friendly Catalan troops, narrowly saving his life. Seeing the situation no longer tenable, an order to retreat was issued. The Royal Guard Cavalry would be tasked with protecting the retreat. But just as the order was issued, most of the rest of the Spanish cavalry finally broke and routed. Pursuers from the Allied cavalry, and pursued from the Spanish, fell directly on to the infantry columns. Many officers trying to rally their men were killed by musket fire and saber wounds. The retreat quickly transformed to a disorderly route to Leida. Only nightfall saved the Spanish army from total destruction. The battle itself was tactically insignificant. 400 Allied soldiers were killed or wounded, including the Earl of Rochford. The Spanish lost 1,000 men killed and 3,000 more wounded including many officers, and Prospera de Verboom, an engineer general 
who, during his time as a prisoner in Barcelona, would write out his proposal for a corps of engineers in the Spanish army. The battle was a definite defeat, but Philip V only needed to take refuge in Leida to regroup. Villadariez was removed from command and replaced by the Marquis de Bay, victor of the Battle of La Gudinha in 1709. He would arrive on the 15th of August with reinforcements to replace the losses from Almenar. Despite the swift victory, the fighting was hard according to Stanhope. The loss of frontline cavalry officers like Rochford showed many high-ranking officers put themselves at risk in combat. The Spanish king even risked death itself on the opposing side. I am very sorry now, my lord, to tell you that this action has cost her majesty very dear and the loss of two young men of quality who would have made a great figure in this country and done it great service. Stanhope would retell in his memoirs. However, despite their differences, Field Marshal Stauffenberg and General Stanhope proved to work well compared to past commanders in Iberia, almost like a Marlborough and Eugen of Spain. Despite their differences in approach to battle, they came out with a victory, one that provided much needed morale for the Allied army and some momentum to win Spain. The Bourbon army evacuated Catalonia and the capital of Aragon. Almanar would be just the beginning of the Spanish campaign of 1710 the last hope to seize Spain from the Bourbons.